Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. Welcome to What's on Your Mind Hawaii. I'm your host, Tim Apicella. Our show is dedicated to what you have on your mind about news topics important to you and to your community. This week, we will discuss the $600 billion trade tariff against China President Trump recently announced. Our guest is Damon Reyes, a successful realtor and in the past have, have operated his own company out of China and Malaysia. Damon shares his concerns about the impact a $600 billion tariff will have on the national economy, home interest rates, and potential effects on the local real estate market. Our second interview is with Daniel, who is a volunteer at the homeless encampment at the Waianae Small, Be Small Boat Harbor. The camp is comprised of 200 to 300 homeless people and has been placed on state lands for close to 10 years. Its leader, Twinkle Borges, or affectionately known as Auntie Twinkle, has been a guiding force to serve as a leader, a friend, a resident, and to ensure the rules of the camps are followed. An informal government has been set up of other representatives, and they're responsible for their section of the camp. No rules, the rules are simple. No motor vehicles, no loud noises, no stealing, dogs are to be locked up, and the gates are locked by 9 p.m. Rules are strictly enforced, and they seem to be working. The sign posted in the camp is clear. It states, anyone found in violation will be given one, a verbal warning, two, a written warning, and three, out. You have to go. No ambiguity there. Last month, the public was invited to tour the camp to see how it operates. It's a model of residents taking care of one another, a place not only where physical healing takes place, but also spiritual healing. After spending an afternoon there, I was both impressed and convinced that it is a model that could serve as, as something that works and the state of Hawaii could replicate it in other areas of the island to address our growing homeless issues. Recently, there were communications at a Waianae neighborhood board meeting that the camp would be shut down by the Department of Natural Land Resources and its residents would be swept out. Governor Ige decided to intercede on the matter. He sat down with Twinkle and an agreement made to look at long-range plans on where the camp could be relocated on other state lands was, was discussed. So for now, it remains that the 250 to 300 residents have a place they call home and a person they trust named Auntie Twinkle. And now, here are those interviews. This is Tim Apicella with Think Tech Hawaii, and our show is What's on Your Mind, Hawaii? I'm here today with David Reese, and today's topic and what's on our mind is the $60 billion tariff announced recently from Donald Trump, specifically the tariff that's going to be against China. Damon, um, you've got a background in economics and also you, you have a master's in international business affairs, is that correct? Uh, master's of Pacific International Relations, yes. Okay, yes. so you've worked professionally in Indonesia and in Malaysia and, and things like that? Japan, um, I did business in China, all throughout Asia, basically. And uh, now I'm a realtor here in Hawaii. So recently, the Dow Jones has fallen about 1,100 points in two days. Uh, today dropped a 1.77% for the last five days, where the Dow is down about 5.26%. As you know, uh, companies that could be affected by this uh, tariff would be Boeing, they're one of the Dow Jones. They're one of the 30 in the Dow Jones. And uh, certainly some you know, farming and commodities and products like that. In your mind, what impact would this $60 billion tariff have, um, not only from what we ship out, but just on the economy um, generally? Yeah. 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 Well, there's, um, there's two parts of this. Um, one part is the inflation factor. As you know, uh, the US imports so many of its goods um, from China. Everything from apparel, footwear, appliances, everything that's being, most of everything being sold out of Costco, which is just down in the, in the valley here. Um, so what will happen there is the prices will, will go up. They'll not just buy a little, but they will go up by quite a bit. And what has kept um, the damper on our business cycle recently fluctuating, going so high and going so low, like boom and bust, is the fact that essentially we have exported our inflation in bust and boom times uh, to China. 
everything gets so uh, manufactured there so inexpensively that it's really kept the lid on on inflation and also services to some degree we uh, we farm those out to India um, so basically inflation is going to go up and we're not talking about a little bit it could be go up as much as one and a half two percent what happens when inflation goes up um, in most business cycles, is that the Fed starts turning up interest rates. So what we will see happening is the Fed turning up interest rates probably a little bit quicker than they had planned to. Um, and inflation could be as high as, let's say, it's 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 two percent right now. It could go up to as high as four percent. Let me jump in at that okay. point because the Fed does use both fiscal and monetary policy to regulate interest rates and basically the flow of dollars in the economy. Right. Um, in addition to what products may have, you know, a trade war, we may have a tariff war on. Also, China has a sub substantial amount of our treasury debt. Um, we have a 20 trillion, $21 trillion uh, national debt of which six point, I think it's about 6.7% is funded by outside other, other countries. And the leading country that uh, buys our treasuries, our notes, our bonds is China at $1.2 trillion. So if this really got ugly, if we did get into this tit for tat trade war, um, there's no saying that China could not start not renewing their treasuries as they mature and find other places to park their cash. And then that would mean that our, our treasury or the Fed would have to raise rates to attract other investors to buy all those treasuries. Yeah, yeah. So not only is it inflation that can affect interest rates, but also how much debt is being re renewed and re rolled over by China. Exactly. And so what happens um, is, so the, the treasury, we, we have a mountain of uh, treasury bills that are bought by both the United States and, and also China. And China contributes to a lot of that. If they stop buying or stop renewing uh, the, uh, the the buying of the treasury bills, um, the treasury bills would start to the price of those treasury bills um, would start to go down. Now I know this sounds um, it's hard it's a little hard to grasp, but when treasury bills the price of treasury bills goes down, it's inversely correlated to the interest rate or the yield. It's really called the yield. And so as treasuries uh, go down, the prices go down, the yields go up. And so um, things like the 10-year treasury actually compete with 30-year mortgages. And so, and the reason for that is because um, average mortgages, even though they're 30 years, um, people keep them for on average for 10 years when they sell their home and such like that. Uh, so those two things um, compete with each other. So when you see yields on the 10-year treasuries going up, um, mortgage interest rates will also go up. And so um, right now the median home price in, uh, in Hawaii is about $800,000, which is three times the national average. Um, and a lot of that is um, people have to get mortgages. They have to finance for those homes. So we're looking at two things, um, and it's kind of the perfect storm, like you, you mentioned. We'll have the, um, the, uh, the yields on 10-year treasuries go up, which will cause um, a mortgage, 30-year mortgage rates to go up as well. And then on top of that, um, we also have the, uh, the, the trade war with China, which causes inflation. Once inflation comes in, then there's more um, pressure from the Fed to actually increase those rates as well. So it'll be sort of like a double whammy. Well, let me ask you this, because um, a, it was just in the paper yesterday, about 20% of all purchases are outside investors that are buying on Oahu. Um, that's give or take a percentage here and there. So um, if the dollar goes weaker, isn't that advantageous for outside investors to come in and buy here in Honolulu? Uh, yes, absolutely, if the dollar goes uh, gets weaker. Um, and the thing about the outside investors that are coming to Hawaii and buying property, they're not so much the medium price homes. Um, they are mostly the luxury homes and luxury condos. Um, a lot of what is getting um, bought in um, in Kaka'ako, the new high-rise luxury condominiums, are, are bought by Japanese. Um, just to give you quick numbers here, in 2016, it was the same for 2017, just about. There was about $1 billion worth of foreign outside of, outside of the U.S. investment of real estate, real estate and properties here in Hawaii. Of that billion, about 500, I think 575, almost 60% of that was bought by Japanese. Um, a lot of people think it's, it's the Chinese that are buying up, but it's very difficult for them to even get their money out of their country. So 
Um, on the scale of things, yes, China is the number two purchaser of, uh, of uh, real estate in here in Hawaii for foreigners. But uh, Japanese uh, purchase 15 times what the Chinese do. So if you were to add up the second place through 10th place of foreign buyers of, of real estate in Hawaii, they wouldn't even add up to what the Japanese do. So, so to my point, to my point, um, if a trade war happens and the U.S. dollar goes down, um, the yen is actually inversely going to get stronger. And when that happens, basically for the Japanese, it's um, luxury real estate on sale for them. So this actually could be a buying bonanza for foreign investors coming into Honolulu and Oahu. So we're going to have a two, it's going to be a tale of two cities here. You'll have the median range homes, which will probably start falling in prices because um, the interest rates. And then you'll see on the luxury side, um, Japanese and foreigners with the with the weak U.S. dollar coming in on going on a buying spree. Now, this was all positioned originally as to help middle America, specifically the Midwest and the steel production towns and how that, you know, jobs are going to come back to America and put employee you know, Americans back to work. Um, in fact, though, if there is a tariff war and a trade war, a lot of those things that middle America produces, particularly farming products and soybeans and, and things of that nature, that actually can come back to haunt them. And because there is a, a higher tariff on those kind of products. That is absolutely true. And then the other thing where it's going to come back um, and hit us, hit us hard is at Costco, at Walmart. Um, they employ so many people in, in here in Hawaii as well. Um, there will be layoffs there and it will cause uh, unemployment. I figure that if it turns out to be a full-blown trade war that we're probably looking at recession, um, you know, mid 2019 and unemployment rates in general in the U.S. may be as high as 10 percent. We haven't seen 10 percent in um, well over three or four years now since the rates came down significantly from that point. Um, also, the impact, though, if let's say um, middle America is shopping at Walmart because that's where the prices are that people are going to afford. Wouldn't a trade war also cost those, the, the, cause the cost of those items sold at Walmart, because many of them are from China, uh, actually increase? So you have an inflationary factor from the products Absolutely. themselves at the store that middle America buys from. Absolutely. And then it'll be exacerbated by um, so many people being laid off and they won't even be able to buy those goods, and goods from China at the, at the higher, uh, higher tariff prices. So do you think there's any coincidence of the recent change in uh, personnel as far as who's going to be handling, um, you know, foreign affairs and, and things of that nature? Or do you think it was just coincidental? It could be, it could be a little bit of both. Um, uh, our president could be running out of people to actually point to these offices, like uh, the uh, se uh, National Security Advisor, uh, John Bolton, was right. just appointed. And he is just a super hawk. Um, uh, I, I don't want to get into. Well, like, I'm thinking of Larry Kudlow, who is, you know, basically a TV personality. Certainly not an economist, yet he has one of the, you know, one of the most important positions in the administration. So one has to wonder is whether this was all part of a strategy or just kind of came together because uh, President Trump was watching TV one day. We, you know, this is a whole new era for us. We, on a daily basis, we're we're getting tweet bombs. And so um, it could have just all coalesced together um, naturally, but it is a little bit worrisome um, seeing ultra hawks um, that will be will be having the uh, the president's ear, and um, and we've seen the stock market. They're 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 indicative that you know stock market going down is indicative of the same thing that I'm actually saying right now. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, I think. I think our neighbors to the north, Canada, and our neighbors to the south, Mexico, are a little relieved that the, the tariffs on steel and aluminum, um, they were exempt from that. And that's where we get the majority of our steel and aluminum from. And so from that standpoint, I think there was a, a sigh of relief from a lot of people around the world um, that they were exempt from that particular tariff um, on, on those two products. One point on that. You know, we are such an integrated um, global economy now that supply lines and distribution, um, if there's a trade war between China 
everybody will get affected. The, uh, the, the, um, some of the, the things that go into the, uh, the manufactured goods from China come from Mexico. They come from Europe. Everyone gets disrupted. So. I think the term was one world economy. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Damon, I want to thank you very much yes. for take, spending the time to join us on What's On Your Mind Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicella for Think Tech Hawaii, and aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. This is What's On Your Mind Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. And before our next interview about the YNI homeless uh, camp, uh, we're going to take a commercial break. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Our next interview is with Daniel, who's a volunteer at the YNI Homeless Camp. Um, his interview is very insightful, and I hope you enjoy it. With Daniel, and Daniel, there's an open house for the village here, out here in YNI, and it's been published in the paper for last, uh, last week at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, from the, judging from how many people have come here, it looks like it's a success. Tell me why uh, you guys did this. Why, why have an open house, and what is the message you're trying to get across? Um, the main message is that this is a place of healing and an important place because there's a lot of people that could use healing uh, and um, and that this place should be um, preserved the way it is. And the community here that does the healing and is also made up of people being healed um, is allowed to exist here because the threat is that uh, everyone will be forced to leave and all the... Um, uh, building and uh, community uh, structure uh, will be taken away and yeah well it seems there's a bigger message here and you know just by my walking around and listening to you is there seems to be a bigger message that this community is a people that have trust in one another mm -hmm. and there's relationships formed and built mm -hmm. and more than a, a quote-unquote homeless camp or shelter this is a community a real village yes and it it is a village and also a shelter and um, there are people who are in places of desperation. Uh, they've had one too many uh, hard knocks and, and just are not feeling in a, uh, safe. They're not feeling like they're in a place of stability or safety. And uh, they need a place to stay, to be, and to heal. And um, yeah, and so this place is a perfect place for that because it is, like you said, a community um, with people that have built relationships and um, and with people that can come in and be a part of the community and build relationships and, and be part of the healing. And How do you compare this village compared to what maybe many people out have a negative stereotype of the homeless? And how does this village counteract that stereotype? Well, I'd say that um, what makes this village a village is uh, a common um, vision and uh, value and that is that this place needs to be maintained as a place of healing and the person who pioneered that vision is kind of the the leader of this village um, because everyone got behind the vision that she had and her vision was basically um, I know we're all hurting all of us are probably here because we need healing but that doesn't mean that we can lash out at each other, you know, we can't vent on each other. I know we're all frustrated, scared, um, hungry, whatever, uh, but we can't take it out on each other. We got to work together. We got to help each other uh, to heal because we all need healing. And so she would go, if she heard fights, she heard drama, she would go in and intervene and be like, hey guys, we cannot lash out at each other. We got to heal. We got to work together. You need help. I'll help you. You know, I'll cook, I'll cook food for you. I'll, I'll whatever, you know, and so she started doing that and 
just cooking for a lot of kids, a lot of people, feeding and just taking care and being an example of how to heal, you know, and to take care of each other, right? So. Well, what impressed me was to hear that those who have been through the, the journey and trying to heal, they are also required to kind of give back in community service at least eight hours, I believe. Yeah. But also, even after they leave, they still come back. Yeah, because um, there is mandatory community service, and that is obviously within that idea of everyone needs to work together to heal each other. So everyone needs to give in, put in to help take care of each other, whether that's cleaning the, the paths or volunteering in the, um, the donation tent, the free store, um, or helping the Auntie uh, Twinkle in her house cook food for everybody, um, or help with the trash cleanups. Everyone is um, getting a chance to contribute. And that not only is a chance to help with the healing, but it's also healing yourself because part of the healing is um, realizing how good it feels to help others. And I think that a lot of us, when we first get our hard knock and, and we're like unstable and we feel like, oh my God, I'm so afraid and I just wanna grab, 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 gimme, 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 gimme. Um, uh, we need to snap out of that because really the way to feel good again is to be like, give me some, oh, I'll give back. Give me some, I'll give back. You know, uh, uh, that's the that's the real healing. And so, well, that's the uh, the antithesis of really the stereotypes that people have about the homeless is they just yeah. want to take and yeah. take and they never yeah. give back to anyone or anything. So, this village is really a model yeah. for what's going on here on this yeah. island. And uh, what would you say to those people that just have such a negative opinion about the homeless and, and a, you know, for lack of a better term, a, just a negative stereotype? Well, I would say I could see where the stereotype comes from because a lot of people who are houseless are in that state of like, oh my God, I'm so scared. I need, I need, I need, give me, give me, give me, you know, I'll steal, give me, give me, give me, you know, or whatever, right? But, um. So they're acting out of fear. Acting out of fear and, and desperation. Uh, but if they're given the chance to be part of a community where they're safe and they can give back, I've seen a lot of people, their minds have changed. Even Auntie Twinkle, she said that she was in a place of desperation. She was self-medicating, even using ice. And it wasn't until she felt like, oh, I need this, this idea, but I need to heal. We need to heal each other. You know, that's when she healed and it changed her life. And, um, and, and, but it's not just her running this village. Now, this village has, what, anywhere from 200 to 300 people here? Yeah, exactly. And so this team captains, um, she started by herself, basically, you know, helping. But then other people, Auntie Loke, there's a lot of people that caught on. And they're like, yes, I feel it too. I'm not, I'm going to medicate less. You know, I'm going to start thinking just for myself. My healing is going to come from helping others. And so some of them... Um, they got so into it that they just want to do it now. Even though they're like healed, they're good. They just love helping, so they're going to stay and help. Some of us, they they heal others enough just to be healed enough so they can go back into the, mm -hmm. you know. Has the, the state of Hawaii learned anything from this lesson from this village? And particularly, have they been out here for this open house? I think, I think the state of Hawaii is learning a lot. You can tell by... Um, there's a new uh, pro, uh, project um, kind of by the, the airport where there's this, there was sort of encampment under, under the bridges and stuff over there. <clears throat> and rather than just raiding them and banishing them and forcing them to go somewhere else like they used to, they built these like plantation houses. And, and, and I think that's them sort of getting the idea of like, hey, maybe people are kind of congregating together because uh, that is the solution. Like people will come together, help each other heal maybe we should just help that instead of trying to steer them somewhere else like maybe there's something to this like people coming together and helping each other is the best way because it's really efficient because if you have the people who are heal needing healing healing by helping others to heal it cuts down on so much cost you don't need to pay for social work as much and you know it's a, it's sort of like a self-correcting so if let me ask you this. If, if more people on this island were to understand this model, mm -hmm. do you think there'd be less fear or not have the not in my backyard syndrome where I don't want any homeless in my community and it doesn't belong there? And yeah. uh, do you think if they saw this model that that would change their opinions and their values and their attitudes? I think it would change a lot because it would be like, oh, I don't want a hospital in my backyard. It's like, what? Why? You know, you don't want to. Um, 
a healing, a place of healing. Everyone wants a healing place. Well, I think mean, people, their stereotype is that there's going to be crime and there's going to be, you know, there's going to be an adverse element to a neighborhood. And, and so I don't know uh, to what degree do you think you guys can take this model and extend it forward so that other people understand what's going on here? I think that um, if people come, like the people who are taking this tour, they'll realize that this isn't a dump. It's not a prison. It's it's a hospital. It's like a garden. It's a place of healing. And then they'll realize, wow, I want that in my backyard. Because wait, what if I have too, one too many traumas in my life? What if um, I have sexual harassment at work and my dad dies and my dog dies and you know things get overwhelming? Well, I could just go here and, and I can heal right here and I can help people heal. Or or if I'm feeling depressed, I can just go and volunteer. And this is my um, new way of finding comfort in life and helping others and building my community and um so it's a it'll it's i think people will see it as um a place like this is a it's something you want to have around because it's a it's a source of comfort and for you and others well change takes time and it doesn't happen and you know on a, on a on a an accelerated line upward it's you know it's up it's down and it, it takes time what message do you think you would have for either the state legislature or the city council, particularly those politicians that have fear about the homeless. And and what would you say to them on how to basically have more of these kind of villages around the island to help the many, many homeless that are that we're faced with? Well, I would say to them, um, please uh, pay attention and take seriously some of the bills that are being written now. Um, there are some legislatures that are, I think, getting the idea and they're introducing bills already that are sort of uh, basically making exceptions for places like this, like um, and and uh, no, um, allowing for places like this. And so I would just say to those senators that have fears that um, uh, get, give this place a chance, learn more, because it's not a uh, um, it's it's a, it's a place of healing and it's a place of growth and and it's an important place these kinds of places and and it's 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 not the problem it's the uh kind of the solution to the problem the problem is whatever it is that makes people so hurt you know um so uh yes yeah that's... well daniel i want to take thank you for taking the time to share this experience and this model of this village on how it could be a model for everywhere on the island. So, okay. Daniel, thank you for your time for coming on What's, our, What's on Our Mind Hawaii. Thank you very much. I'm Tim Apicella for Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. That's our show for this week. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch us on What's On Your Mind Hawaii. Our next show is on April the 10th. And until then, aloha.